Hi and welcome to The Real Women of Boxing, episode 12, where women with working knowledge and experience of the fight game bring you the latest interviews, news and reviews. Joining me today is my co-host, Lisa Whiteside. How are you doing, Lisa? You all right? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh, yeah, I've just uh, been sparring and then got home, quick shower, got ready, ready for the podcast. So, been a busy afternoon. Hey, you got the guns out, darling. <laughs> the, the building. <laughs> Looking good. Looking very good. Ajiba Ubital um, with a unanimous decision. Yes. Yeah, obviously, Boxer have just announced that Caris Artinstall will be making her professional debut on the 25th of June. So that's exciting. We've also got, obviously, in the amateurs, unfortunately, at the Worlds, the Female Worlds Championships, the Team GB, unfortunately, didn't medal. But Team Ireland uh, made a record and got two females becoming world champions. Um, you had Amy Broadhurst at light welterweight, who beat Imain Khalif of Algeria by unanimous decision. And then also Lisa O'Rourke, who defeated Helena Panguani, um, of Mozambique in the light middleweight decision by split decision. So they did amazing. Yeah, absolutely. But we've got some more news. Finally, <laughs> Miss Whiteside, she's back and she's signed with Pobellium. Mm, How amazing. Yeah, I'm really chuffed that it's been announced. It's been obviously a bit of a long time waiting. and uh, But, you know, it, it, I've had to wait and then it got announced and hopefully get a fight date and get, get cracking. I can't wait. Yeah, we'll have a little chat about that later. I'm sure there are some uh, some people in your division <laughs> quaking. <laughs> so let's uh, do a few reviews from a couple of the fights from the weekend. It was absolutely amazing weekend for boxing, to be fair. Uh, so we've just picked a handful. Uh, firstly, uh, Raven Chapman versus Gabriella Mezai uh, on Friday the 20th. So this was the first... Uh, fight for Queensbury uh, promotions and BT Sport for Raven Chapman and actually I think she's the well not I think she is the first person or the first woman I should say uh, to sign with them since Nicola Adams um, yeah what well, do you think gone in 60 seconds wasn't it it's loving eh? <laughs> and she did not mess around our Raven you know just so tough for her um, what a statement you know what a hello I'm here type of uh, a statement and yeah it was it was lovely to watch which I, I wanted to watch more because you know but she did the job and she did it in style so really chuffed for her then body shots just crucified her didn't they <sighs> I know Richie Woodall was saying it was the backhand over the top that finished it but I think it was the body shots um, I think they were the ones body. and then obviously she she got with that right hand but I don't think it was that that hurt her I think it was the body shots so placement was lovely and Raven's She's she's a strong girl, so she's going to go a long way. She is. She absolutely is. I mean, she was, to be fair, trying to tease it out of Mezai in the beginning. It was like uh, she, Mezai was covering up a lot, wasn't she? But then once she engaged, it was like yeah, Raven was exactly. like, Ooh. She weren't letting her go, was she? So, um, no, it was, a, it was a good statement. Obviously, that girl's been in with quite a lot of people and gone the distance and mm. for Raven to do that and, and in less than 60 seconds. Um, she probably needed to do some pads or something afterwards, so she so she felt like she'd had had a session or something. But uh, now she was absolutely made up for a um, lovely person and a huge future. Yeah, absolutely beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I think it was a body shot that uh, yeah. that actually finished the fight. It dropped. She obviously dropped her, um, and uh, <laughs> Mezai did no, not she want was any not more interested, of that. Was she? So. He stayed down. <laughs> not, not at all. I think also probably uh, Raven. Raven had a hotel room Saturday night in London, so yeah, maybe yeah, she should so let's do it quick and then get out for the night. <laughs> the world and blame her. That's a cracking <laughs> idea. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I mean, more, can't wait to see more. Saturday the 21st of May, uh, yeah. match room card. First, let's talk about uh, Ellie Scottney. Uh, versus Maria Cecilia Roman. I have to say, first off, it felt to me a little bit like she boxed like nobody else was in the room. I'm talking about Ellie. Yeah, now. She, do you Your know thoughts? what? It was beautiful to watch. A uh, shot, so shot selection. It was so varied as well. Mm. You know, she was going to the head and the body. I think 
from probably round six onwards, I think she just gained confidence each round. And then I think her shot selection and everything just come off so naturally um, that, um, yeah, the other girl didn't have a hope in hell's chance. So um, footwork, I think that was key as well because she was picking a beautiful shot, but then getting out only in small margins, but just moving her feet tiny little Mm -hmm. bit and then she'd go again. So, no, she's got to be chuffed with that performance. And, yeah, she really she really made a good statement there too. Um, she's just, yeah, she's a talented boxer, really like her, lovely person. Um, so, you know, will, will she get the, the fight that she was asking for at the end of that? So we'll see. Well, well, well we will see. I mean, I personally thought that the, the movement was just yeah. fluid. Yeah, it's so it was natural. So fluid, it was gorgeous. Like, it's, oh... Do you like you were saying the distance? It was like okay, then she was advancing, and then she was just taking a little step back, and then countering off that. I think she's absolutely gorgeous at long range. Um, if I'm gonna be a little bit greedy, just a little tiny bit of a work on the inside. Yeah, I think would you agree? Sometimes I think Ellie needs that. That she needs that space. I think to get her great work off when she gets that space taken from her. I think yeah, she just maybe just work a bit on that a, a little bit, but. It, you know, that's really picking, being really picky at all. You know, it's what was it, a fifth fight against a former world champion? Yeah. Uh, and to put on a performance like that, I think she wanted to because I think she's been upset of her previous performances. Um, but you know what? It happens, doesn't it? Sometimes it just doesn't click on the night or the, or, or the day. So um, for her to have done that, and you know, you can see on social media the, the backing she's got and you know, everyone's saying what a great night, what a great performance. It's, it's lovely to see. Going back to what we're talking about on the inside work, um, I totally agree. It's literally about creating a little tiny bit of space. And that's like half a step a step, just to give yourself that little bit of space. I felt like, you know, all the pieces of this current jigsaw puzzle just fell into place last night. And I, I have to say, Roman is not a bad little boxer. Um, She lacks punching power, uh, so she kind of doesn't have those answers to stop an opponent in their tracks. Um, I would like to see her uh, be a little bit more spiteful, but she gave Scotney, I, in my opinion, more of a run for money than she did against Ebony Bridges. I don't know if it was a night off. Yeah, it's weird because I was quite shocked with that when she was going for a world title and the first half of that fight she was just literally standing there with her hands up and taking shots where she didn't do that with Ellie. You know, you could see that the want and the desire for it, which that obviously wasn't for a world title this time. So, yeah, a bit peculiar. Um, I think she boxed a lot better than she did against Bridges. Um, but then Ellie still schooled her. So I think I missed the, the first bit of the of the fight. And I hear that, that people were saying there was a couple of rounds where... Um, she like it died down a little bit, but from the start scorecards, I think she won every round on one scorecard. And when um, the scores were read out, um, I think she only dropped one point by two judges, and the other one didn't. You know, give her every single round. Ellie seemed a bit shocked, but I think she's quite a self-critical person, isn't she? And she always wants to improve and do better. And she probably thought there was a couple of rounds that she weren't happy with. Um, so yeah, she definitely needs to build her self confidence in that because I think I heard her on one of the on one of the rounds in the corner. She's like, "Did I win that? Did I win that round?" So, um, and then I think I think I heard her say at one point, "Yeah, have, have I got caught?" But it was blood from the other girl. So she's a bit of a worrier, but in a in a really lovely way, she's <laughs> top top girl and made up for it. I just I just hope the big opportunities do arise for her. I really do. So in terms of uh, the confidence, I agree. I think uh, the whole key yeah. with her is confidence. She's not a showy-offy person. You know, she's just there for the boxing. And to be honest with you, I think that that's probably what hindered her performance last time, but that helped her performance this time. And the other thing being is, you know yourself, when you're in the flow there and you almost feel like it's effortless, you're like, hold on, did I? Yeah. I can't, yeah. I'm not sure if I yeah. did well. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's down to how good she was last night. It's uh, important to mention also that the last fight that Roman had was against Bridges and it was for the IBF bantamweight title. Um, yeah, I just thought she stepped up Roman this time and I'd actually like to see her again. She's got facile hands. 
Uh, she just needs to get a little yeah, bit definitely. more spiteful. I think, like you say, it's just that that punching power isn't really there to then hold people off. But um, she's she's a decent boxer. Um, obviously, she's cut, she came up to Super Bantam where she boxed at Bantam, obviously, uh, against Bridges. So I don't know if that would make much of a difference. It's only, what, a, a key and a half difference or something like that. So... Um, but yeah, no, it was it was a cracking fight to watch and another great display for female boxing. And it's just, you know, it's making people really enjoy watching us. And it's the norm now, isn't it, to have not just one female contest on, one or two on each of the of the main, you know, um, cards. So it's fantastic. Really, really made up for it. And then the call out at the end, yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, uh, there's a bit of a. Uh, uh, she's getting, she's becoming a bit like uh, Savannah <laughs> yeah. Marshall coming out of a shell. Yeah, do you know what? <laughs> the jelly is quiet, isn't she? So then when she just instantly did that, do you know what? I was like, go on, girl. I was like, fair play. Why not? You know, and every, you know, to, that yeah. shows, doesn't, it's not, doesn't show cockiness. It shows self belief. And like you said, with her, her building her confidence in that latter part of that fight, I think she's just like, she knows what she's capable of. And so, yeah, she's she wouldn't, you know, she's not that type of person, is she, to call someone out if she doesn't think she'd be capable of winning. So, um, yeah, I think re- really chuffed that she did that. Quite quiet, though, on the social media last night. Uh, after Ellie's fight the last time, I mean, there was a few spiteful, um, you know, comments. And I think the, the, the thing is, we know what she can do, and it might come across... Uh, it could come across, I guess, as being biased, but it's like, you know what? We yeah. know what she can do. And we haven't seen, or let's say the professional side of things, they haven't seen what she can do. So last night I did have a little scroll through and I thought, oh, there's a bit of silence now. Yeah, it just... A bit of silence. People yeah, are good. starting to believe really, in it. really, really chuffed for her. Um, obviously, she's at my weight that I'm coming back at, so... And we've even, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about sparring anyway, but obviously she's down south and I'm up the north. But, you know, if that, that ever fruitioned in the future, it'd be absolutely awesome, wouldn't it? And I know that we both have utter respect for each other. Um, you know, then if we get in that ring together, it'd be awesome too. It would be. And for the fight fans, again, it would just be a rubber stamp of how quality female fights yeah, can definitely. be. definitely. And like you said, it's a... There's a lot out there now. There's a lot of girls coming through um, with at a high level. So there's not going to be, you know, we want to have them fights. You don't want easy fights or being gifted things or anything like that. That has occurred, unfortunately, in the past. A man won't get a world title shot for nothing, will he? They've got to box the best to be the best. So, yeah, it's an exciting time. It is. And uh, cracking on to the next fight, uh, Chantelle Cameron versus Victoria Bustos for the WBC and IBF World Super Lightweight titles. Uh, it was defence, obviously, of Chantal's belts. Um, Bustos has fought for multiple world title fights before uh, at various weights. Uh, lost to Katie Taylor, Cecilia Brackass, but so she's no... No, and uh, she's never been stopped, has she, either? So um, it just showed. But I think it was, it was probably frustrating for Chantal because of how long she's had to wait. I kind of think you kind of saw that at the beginning of the first couple of rounds. I think she was trying too hard as in because she's deep down angry over the situation. But when she started, when she relaxed into it, she just, you know what she's like. She's relentless. She's non-stop. Um, and again, it was great to see her, you know, boss the fight. You know, she didn't need to go for a knockout. She didn't need to. She just, you know, boxed lovely. Um, great different ranges of shots so no made up for her I'm actually quite glad she didn't rip the girl's head off that's... <laughs> I I was like, don't take it know, out on her what, just... that's what I was quite scared of because she was like basically like pre-interviews wasn't it I'm just so angry I just want to and uh, I think you could see that she was a bit not stiff because she's not stiff at all but you know what I mean it wasn't a usual flowing self initially but it took a round or two and then bang she's on back, back, back on it and um, you know, it's been a long time out for her from her last fight because of what happened. So, but mm. she needs these big October. fights now, and it needs to happen. She needs, you know, it, obviously she's a world champion now, but she, she's got so much more to give and so much more for us all to see. I mean, I don't think, uh, no disrespect uh, 
to Bustos. I don't think she posed any real threat to Cameron. And in the words of Andy Lee, Chantal's work always has a bit of spite in it. <laughs> uh, she sets out to hurt her opponents. And I thought, do you know what? He's He's got her uh, number. Um, I think, like you just said, I think not, the problem is... You know, you gear yourself up for these big fights. She's waited around. She's waited for a long time. And I know some of the fans also are really frustrated about uh, the fight between... Uh, the undisputed fight that is supposed to happen between Kaylee Reese and her. And it hasn't happened. Um, to my knowledge also, there's been no statement made uh, by Matchroom. So if uh, people want to check out episode four of our podcast, Kaylee Gives Us the Lowdown. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll uh, we'll wait and see what happens there. But I think uh, you know what, it was a good uh, outing. Nice yeah. to get the rounds under your belt, and uh, onto the and one. people got to realise it's you know it's it's her, her living, isn't it? You know that that's her job. So if you don't, unfortunately, if you don't get paid, if you don't fight, you don't get paid. So it's you know if the longer it goes, it's then you know financial difficulties and things like that. You just I don't think. The public understand that at times that that in a pro in the pro game it can be quite tough. I think some people understand and some people just don't care. They're just it's it, it's it's literally like you're not human beings. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> well, it's obviously like with Chantel, with the she had all that fat shaming on social media, didn't she? And it was disgusting. And you know, so, even when I've been announced, that they, I still got silly comments on social media. But I've kind of now realised that you know what. These people are nothing. These trolls. It's it's pointless to get obsessed about it. What you need to do is be happy about the positivity that you got and the support and you know it's that that's what you've got to think about. Also, Lisa, I guarantee you that when you fight, those sorts of comments will just get quieter and quieter yeah, and quieter. I hope so. And they I see really your hope so on to Joshua Boatsy versus uh, Craig Richards. Um, God, that was gorge. I mean, it was one of those, again, British, uh, great British uh, battles. Uh, yeah, what did you I think, think to that? Josh got the tactics bob on in that. He didn't... They say that both of the boxers start slow, uh, usually. So I think mm -hmm. Josh has thought, right, let's get up, get some rounds in under my belt. So he's got them, so he's already ahead. So then, obviously... It's got to be chased chased back then. So no, I think he started quicker. He seems to have changed his style now. He's got a new coach. I noticed he's mm. like the his stance and his guard seems quite different to what it has been in the past. But you know, obviously, a change of coaches and style and ad adaptations. So yeah, no, it was it was lovely to watch. Yeah, talking about Joshua Bawatsi. Yes, there's been. A slight change in style. I still think, or oh, it feels like he's still trying to gel, you know, his old stuff with his new stuff and trying to find him. It it it, it didn't seem to sit in his body as comfortably as before, yeah, if that just, makes I sense. He just looked not odd, not odd had, just not uncomfortable, but just, yeah, like you say, uneased a little bit and uh, not agitated, mm. but he, he just his guard looked a bit different to what it has in the past. I think in the latter round, I think he reverted back to to what he has done in the past, and I think it got it got it working a lot better. But um, you know, things change, and if you make you know changes in coaching and stuff, you, you're going to add things to your bow, and you know that's what you've got to do. And also, let's be fair; it's going to take you a bit of a while. He was with his old coach, you know, since the amateurs. Obviously, he was at GB as well, but his club coach has been the same person. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of time to bed in. I think he was a, little, a lot more, let's say, aggressive when he came out of the gate. In fact, yeah. both of them were, to be fair. I think the the build-up was, it was almost bragging yeah, rights on the street. Well, they're from the same area, <laughs> aren't they? So they live, is it a street away from each other or something? I can't, yeah. yeah I'm not sure. I know they're, I'm they're not like sure. very close. And you just think, wow, yeah, you've got you've got something to prove here, haven't you? So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a good build-up and, a, you know, a good fight to for the fans and it was close wasn't it and um, I think it was just that Joshua um, obviously got them first first rounds in um, you see, I'd say Joshua was the, the puncher out of them both 
Uh, he always has. Yeah. He's been, na- you know, that's one thing when I was on GB with him, you know, so such a nice, humble, quiet person. And then he's just vicious in the ring with just natural strength. I know, natural it's crazy. Strength. So, yeah, it was great to watch. I had a gorgeous mm. jab last night. And I think, uh, I'm going to be honest, it felt a little bit, when I was talking to people about this fight, it felt a little bit like more people were leaning towards Richards because he's fought the better opponents, you know what I mean? And, you know, um, obviously, Boatsy's only ever really put yeah. his fighters out, hasn't he? In the, I did wonder about his pacing. I did, because, uh, you, you know, like, it's all very well doing it in the gym. Do you know what I mean? But it would have been like the first time under that level of pressure that he has to try and pace the rounds. And that sometimes when he was pacing the rounds, he was he was switching off a little bit and getting caught with just, yeah. just silly, silly shots. Just momentary lapses of um, concentration. But again, I'm guessing that's something that he... Yeah, you're going you know, to have little blips like that, aren't you? And, you know, this is great now. Like, you can look at back at a fight that has gone the distance and to see where he's at, may, you know, where he can make them little improvements to make him, be, you know, for when he becomes a world champion. So he's got to have everything, um, you know, in the bag and ready to go. So, no, he's, um, he's, he's one to be reckoned with, isn't he? And I, I hope he gets that world title, I really do. Drop a comment, like, and uh, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know when we drop new content. So... Give us an update on what's been happening with yeah, you. Yeah, so Liz. obviously, um, just a few days ago, it's, it's finally been announced that I've done a signed a promotional deal with Fabellan, um, and just awaiting a confirmation on fight date, but the same July. Um, I've just not got the actual date confirmed. So, it's been a long time waiting, and I'm, I'm like, I'm a, when am I fighting? And but you know, it's the pro game. You just got to be patient, which isn't one of my fortes. <laughs> <laughs> So, is it anybody's? Um, so yeah, now obviously um, ready and raring to go. Um, going to be on obviously a good platform, and they're going to get me into a position, you know, in you know in fast track mode. Really, um, you know, I want that world title for my baby boy, and it's it's not me being uh, overconfident or arrogant. I just you know I want to push on. Um, there's some decent girls out there at Super Bantam, um, and I'm willing to fight them because. If you want to be the best, like I said, you, you've got to box the best. Was there a huge sort of sigh of, you know, oh, big breathe out when you finally put yeah, that Yeah, definitely. You know, it's been been tough times, hasn't it? Because I should have been coming back last year. Um, I was actually on the brink of signing with Frank Warren before. Um, it, it was back in August time, I think it was, last year. Um, deal was just about mm. to be done. And then I ripped my shoulder, um, my tendon in my rotator cuff. Mm. So it was devastating to say the least, but in some ways a blessing in disguise because then uh, my manager, obviously, um, Adam, he's um, absolutely awesome and got me a cracking deal. I just want to get in that ring now. I just want to fight. So, you know, know. People, unfortunately, you know, people do say, oh, she's been out. I think one of the comments someone put on social media was, when did she win the Commonwealth? How long ago was that? It must have been named someone else. <laughs> Who cares? She won. <laughs> and she I was won. Like, and then someone else was giving me... <laughs> and, and fair play, the nice people were like, hang on a minute, she's been out because she's had a baby and she's been, been a parent. And I was just like, I just liked that person's comment. I didn't even engage with the other ones because, you know, they've got to understand, yeah, do you know what? I wouldn't change it for the world. He's He is my world title. I just need to win him one now and say thank you back. Do you know what as well, Lisa, to be fair, um, you know, I think in hindsight, you giving birth, all the things that you went through, um, brilliant that you got yourself back into shape, which is near impossible for a lot of women straight after and, and so quickly. Um, but I think it's probably a blessing in disguise that you've given your body a little bit of a, you know, a break, breathe out and now... Definitely, it's yeah. Time. I think you're completely right, Jackie. I'm, I'm a bit of one of those. I want everything yesterday. <laughs> like I say, no patience. But <laughs> um, then, yeah, you just have to listen to your body at times, don't you? And I'm just doing everything, um, you know, in the right way to make sure I'm, you know, the whole package. I'm fit. I'm strong. Um, great on weight. 
you know, I'm not going to go down to silly, going back down to fly weight again. You know, I did that for seven years and that was detrimental to my body. Listen, stay tuned to hear Lisa's story. So if you fancy supporting our channel, uh, please consider purchasing a piece of merchandise. The link is below. Uh, we filmed uh, Lisa's story back in, uh, I think it was just after the first lockdown and we have been waiting to drop it. Um, so stay tuned for that. What you've done in the amateurs, she is the former amateur European, EU, Commonwealth and world medalist with over 140 fights. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, thank you, yes. Good, good. It's nice, nice to see you in your uh, in your own little home setting. Yeah, it's good to show you around. Yeah. So listen, we, we know so much, Lisa, about your amateur career and how amazing that was. And obviously you've just now shifted over into the pro scene. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, how you started boxing, because I know you started as a keep fitter, if that's the correct word. But talk to me about, you know, starting uh, boxing. Yeah, um, basically, I, I used to kickbox um, for fitness. You have to excuse the baby in the background. <laughs> you have to take your stairs. <laughs> Um, I did that for about four or five years. Okay. Never competed. Um, and it was just something I, I just got into and enjoyed. And I took some time out of that because I then joined the police force. So doing shifts and things like that. Um, but then I always had that bit of a, a regret that I've never competed in any type of sport, um, obviously combat sports. So I just Googled women's boxing. And um, yeah, that was when I was 21. And I Googled, I found a female that was in um, boxing in the local area and walked into that gym at 21 and then 35 years old now. And I'm, I'm still doing it. And obviously I've done everything throughout them years. So it was just, and I, I, did, I did, I didn't go in there thinking, oh, right, that's it. I want to do this. I want to do that. I just went because I enjoyed doing it. And then as soon as I started, I was like, oh, and I was so nervous for my first fight. I've never been so scared in my life. I was petrified, not about being hit, about the fitness side of it. I don't think people realize what fitness you require to get yeah. in that ring. Yeah. Um, so after my first fight, I actually lost my first fight. Um, and it you know, a lot of people be like, oh, well, would you carry on? And it just gave me more desire then. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the nervousness I used to get in boxing was unbelievable. But, yeah, it started when I was 21. So you start when you're 21. I mean, have you always been quite a, a feisty woman? What were you like as a child? Um, I've always been into sport, yeah, I've been, but I wouldn't say, like, no, not, I never thought, oh, I want to do boxing, or I didn't really follow boxing or anything like that. Um, brought up with three brothers and a sister, so brought up in a busy household with three brothers and a sister, um, and always involved in sports. Obviously, all my brothers were into football, running. One of my brothers did like boxing, and he went. To, he used to go to the Jennings gym at Chorley and things like that, so, um, yeah, it just kind of... I just fell into it in a way, really. I, I fell into getting into kickboxing, tie boxing, and then I just kind of realised, oh, I'm, I, I've got something about this, and I enjoy it, and it gave me that drive. So, um, yeah, and I never looked back, really. Being in the household, I think, with boys as well, that probably had a, <laughs> played a part. Yeah, you'd always be play fighting, or they'd be doing tricks on you. And hi one of the times, my one of my brothers hid my Easter eggs from me on it. You know, things like that it used to be just so. Yeah, you'd always be fighting and play fighting and things like that. So yeah, I suppose it always has a part of it. Yeah, you know, what part did your father play in sort of shaping your childhood in um, terms of sport? Yeah, it's, it's weird because every single one of us was really, really sporty, um, always dead supportive. You know, I did every sport under the, you know, what you could think of to the point that, you know, people are like, oh, did you do this? Yeah, I went horse riding, I tried horse riding, I tried ballet, I tried tap dancing, I tried football. <laughs> you know, I did everything. And my mum and dad would always support us and let us, you know, if they want to if we wanted to change and not do that, then they would never put pressure on us. I think that's a key thing, is that I never felt pressured by my parents. They just wanted me to be happy, um, and my, obviously my brothers and my sister, so. 
Yeah. Do you mind talking about your father at all? Because you uh, you did lose him uh, recently. Um, well, it's seven years now. So I lost him the same week I joined Great Britain squad. Wow. So, yeah, we got... Um, he got diagnosed with cancer just prior to me going out to the World Championships. And that was the qualifier for London 2012. Um, but I'd, because I'd medalled at the Europeans at 57 kilos, um, which my mum and dad came to Rotterdam and watched me, um, I then got um, asked if I wanted to go to the Worlds at 57. And that was a non-Olympic weight. Um, I had to take my own time off work and things like that. Um, but then literally, I think it was like the week before, he obviously did, told our family that he'd been diagnosed with bowel cancer. So the first thing I was like, I'm not going to China, I'm not going to China, I'm not going to across, you know, the other side of the world. And he's like, no, no, do it for me, do it for me. And um, it's probably why I've actually got a tattoo um, on the side of me now. And it was Tasha Jonas, because obviously a very good friend of mine, and she was my roommate at the Worlds. And um, the saying that she said was, God gives his hardest battles to his toughest soldiers. And we used that setting throughout my dad's treatment. And then afterwards, obviously for myself, now it's on the side and takes me all the way to everything I go through. Lisa, for somebody, try to do... I, I mean, I'm always quite... Um, I'm always quite surprised, if I'm honest, how somebody can pull it together and go and perform under those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, it is strange because if you actually look at some of the times of when, like you say, going to the world just having found that out and... I was only in, what, I'd only probably had 20-odd fights as an amateur and went out to the world. Uh, my quarterfinals against this Ukraine, which I think she now boxes at, like, 60 kilos, even heavier. Absolute tank. Didn't stop coming at me, but in my head, all I wanted to do was make sure I won a medal. Uh, so there was nothing going to defeat me. And, yeah, it's, I think, I don't know, like you say, it's my upbringing or just the way I deal with things is if I've got that focus and I've got that goal, I just keep on track and, and use it, you know, to, to push me on for it, really. Was it a situation where you kind of had to put it in a, a, a box in, in a respect and then examine it once you'd won your medal? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say that, especially, like, when... Um, the week my dad passed away, like I say, we'd got onto GB and I dropped down to 51 kilos to get on the weight. And uh, off I went to GB for my first week. And um, and then I get a phone call off my mum and my sister saying, or off my sister saying, you need to come home quickly. So I said to GB, I'm going to have to go home. And um, my dad actually told me off when I come home. What are you doing home? It's your first week on GB. Obviously not as as uh, as, as easy as that, but... and. Um, I just said, oh, no, it's all right, Dad, they've given what, me a treat. some swear words? No, no. <laughs> and uh, he was just like, so he was just... And then I said, oh, no, don't worry, they, they're going to they're gonna be they, they're fine. They've given me a training plan. But he was more concerned that I wasn't there for the week and he died the next day. Um, but the main thing was, again, I said to him, I said... I was laying next to him, and that was the day he passed away. I said to him, I said, so, so right, they've given me a training dead, um, a training program uh, for the EU Championships. I said, and I'm going to go and get you a gold medal, Dad. I'm going to get you a gold medal. And by this point, he couldn't really speak, and he just got this lovely smile out of him, which I'll never, ever forget. He smiled, and he then passed away. So, as you can imagine, I've probably put a lot of pressure on myself there. I was going to say. Um, so, yeah, I was an absolute emotional wreck at the EUs. It was only four weeks later. Now, I think most people would have probably have gone, I can't do it, I'm sorry. And it would have been, you know, I'm sure GB would have been quite happy to support me in that way. But in my mindset was train hard. I've got to go and get that gold medal. Um, so out of all the medals and all the travelling of the world, the one that means the most to me now is that EU gold. The psychologist was out there, the GB psychologist, and we went for walks every day and I shed quite a lot of tears and had quite a tough draw um, and I'd pulled like one of the best girls out there who was normally at the Olympic weight at 51, but she was in at 54 and I'd gone out at 54 because Nicola Adams was in at 51. And... Um, the Polish girl, I think she'd beat Nicola twice. So, you know, the word was that, oh, Lisa's not going to beat her. Um, I believe it was being said around the camp and to play mind games with me and such. 
so emotional times but i was just completely focused and but like you said then i just stayed focused on that and then i weirdly enough afterwards um tanya arnold from the bbc um she was interviewing and I then explained that why I had to get this gold medal and all I could see was her behind the camera in floods of tears and I was quite focused and composed and I was like, well, that's what I was doing. This is for my dad and for my family and she was an absolute mess. I think then eventually when I come home, it sinks in and, you know, get you get emotional. So, but, you know, I was able to achieve what I promised him, so it's always going to be the probably the biggest achievement of my boxing career. That do you think he knew that he was going to pass away? Yeah, that yeah. I think we'd um, me and my husband had managed to take him and my mum over to Egypt for a week. He wanted to go away for a week, but it was very very poorly. And my poor husband for a week. It was a ho- me and my husband had already booked the hotel, so it wasn't disabled friendly or anything like that. And then we booked my mum and dad onto it last minute because they wanted to come away, and. And my husband literally carried my dad around for a week in a, in a wheelchair, but not in a wheelchair-friendly environment. And um, he'd, say to my, he'd say to my husband, John, I want to go down to the dock, back b- b- bottom of the dock, and he's like having to drag him all the way through, or he wants to go on the beach. And, you know, it was just... But that week, I think it, what was hard for me was coming home, you could see that he'd... I think he'd made his peace and he'd had his little final week and he looked very, very weak coming home and then a couple of days later he was at the specialist and the specialist was like, any day, any day now. So, yeah, I think he'd decided maybe it was time. But don't get me wrong, my dad was a fighter and he fought all the way. He had chemotherapy twice, um, but, I, well, he had the tumour removed, then he had chemotherapy, then the second chemotherapy. If anything, if I'm going to be honest, I feel like the chemotherapy, what, probably killed my dad um because the treatment it just you know he got blood clots and yeah it was horrendous and you know i look now and think i never knew anything about cancer prior to it and now i'm like oh you know it's what in one in two people so the chance of someone in my family or my family getting it you think would you have chemotherapy me personally i wouldn't i but obviously each to their own and every situation is different and hopefully technology and things improve and can get better treatments out there i, I quite like the uh, picture of him uh, <laughs> on the back of mick on the back. <laughs> mick just carrying him about <laughs> what, 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 what's that what do you mean you, saying, laughing at, um, you know you were saying that mick was carrying him around like, oh i just want to go down oh, did you there. Mean, sorry john yeah, sorry. i'm getting confused yeah no like, oh, i just want to go down there i just want oh go yeah down. yeah, I bet was, uh, yeah. A proper laugh at that oh yeah john john and my dad were like best friends they're a really really good relationship so but then my dad wasn't scared to say right john do this for me do that for me <laughs> so yeah he'd, uh, and then you'd look at john and he'd be shattered i'm thinking we've come away for a holiday he needed another the holiday after it. Bless it. So. so you don't really do things by halves. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so I'm intrigued. You, you, you've talked about the fact that you were in the police force. When did you join the police force? And why did you join the police force? I joined the police the same time I started boxing, just about the same, roughly around the same time, so about 21. Um, I was a community, I was a community beat police officer prior to that for a couple of years, just to get life experience and things like that to be able to get into the job because it's very, very difficult to get into Lancashire Constabulary. Um, so then, yeah, got got into the job and obviously found boxing as well. So. My, my poor parents were like, what are you doing to me, Lise? You're a police officer and you're boxing. And then just to make it worse, I then went and got on firearms. So I made it even bigger for them, bigger I, worries. I, so. I, I, I find that amazing, to be honest with you. So it's like, oh, do you know what? I think what I'll do now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you always... It's one of those... I'm, it's a hard one. I, I, I don't ever just settle. I always want to achieve and like carry on and pursue something I, th- I think it's just my character that I am and I don't think I could just do a nine to five job and just you know I've just never been that type of person I need something to have a focus and a goal on what is it like to first you know handle a gun yeah like obviously the when we f- when I first went and it's exciting but nerve-wracking because yeah you, you're la- you're handling a live weapon but obviously you're being trained by the the best aren't you so 
just kind of take it in your stride and enjoy it. It was, yeah, it was very enjoyable. But yeah, you've got to obviously be switched on 100% of the time. And then obviously you give up your dream, I would say, because there comes a point where you have to choose between boxing and being on GB. Yeah, yeah. How difficult was that? Yeah, so obviously it was the choice of take a career break and knowing that if I took a career break from the police, that would be stepping away from firearms because you have to be obviously continually qualifying within your, your shooting and things. And then there's the boxing, but the love for the boxing, it, there wasn't really a question in it. I knew that, you know, that's the path that I wanted to make. I never knew I was going to be making that path. I did it purely for enjoyment and fitness. And then obviously I started getting good. I started winning titles and then I got the opportunity and it was like, it can't be missed. Why, why wouldn't I do it? So luckily, you know, I got a career break. So I was able to have that break from the police. Um, but I only got a career break for five years. I extended it for a year because I was on GB for seven years. Um, but then they wouldn't extend it any further, obviously with going into the pro career. So I dis obviously decided to step away completely from the police. So how long actually were you a police officer for? Six years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because 27 when I joined GB. I mean, I'm guessing it was quite difficult because I don't want to call it a number two, but there was somebody in front of you, wasn't there? Yeah, obviously, at the time, it wasn't something I really thought about. It's just the fact, the amazing achievement of getting on GB. But obviously, I went on at the... I used to box at 57 kilograms, but it was a non-Olympic weight. So they didn't want me to go up to 60 because they said I was too small. And um, obviously looking at it, I had to prove myself down at 51. So I went to a tournament, got to go on. But obviously the number one that was on GB at the time was Nicola. Rath yeah. It's interesting because I've been around a long time, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> and there was always this sort of, um, just this beautiful buzz around you and her and, dare I say it, uh, you know, people were always saying that they thought that you would, I'm trying to be diplomatic, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that you would overtake her in, in some respects. I mean, was that quite difficult to be kind of on the outside of that whole situation? Yeah, it was tough at times, um, you know, because I never, ever out of them seven years got my opportunity to prove myself and win or lose, you know, just give me that opportunity. And I never got that opportunity to, to show my skills and to what level I was at. But, you know, it, it, it was what it was and I just kind of had to deal with it and go with my... Um, route rather than try and chase her route so you know we should have boxed each other i think it was before the last commonwealth Games, so before glasgow 2014 i think it was or whenever it, when it, we should have boxed each other at liverpool echo arena at the okay. abas um and then i get a phone call on the thursday th the day before the tournament started from rob mccracken to say that she'd had a um a, a car stolen a kit was in the boot and she was too distressed to compete. But since then, I've heard that she had never any intentions of competing. Um, but she couldn't say she was injured because we had other tournaments coming up. So it's old news, isn't it, now? It's, it's one of those. But it's just a shame for the British public and for Nicola as well, you know, to, you know, she has achieved some massive things as an amateur. And for people to have been questioning that I could have beat her, if I was in that role, you'd want to prove to make sure that people knew that, no, I can beat her. But everybody's different and everybody's situation's different. So, you know, it is what it was. The saddest thing about that situation is that you gave up your career as a police officer. You put it all on the line and I, I'm guessing you expected GB to put everything on the line for you? Yeah, I thought it'd be a lot fairer, I've got to say. I thought it would be a lot fairer and it, it's a difficult one because if you look at like so you look at athletes, 100 metre sprinters, well it's the one that crosses the line that gets selected to go to the, the Olympics, to go to the qualifiers where with boxing, they say they go off your um, you know, your experiences and, your, and what you've done in tournaments and things but Really, should they not be box offs? Should they not be torn? You know, should you not box the person that's in your category and show who's the best? Even if you say, right, within the year, you have to box each other three times, and out of them three, you know, they get to go. But it, it, 
it just isn't that set up it's just, it's not it never has I just had to bide my time and I did prove myself over and over again you know when she was still on the squad I, w I went to the worlds and you speak to the head of GB and anybody else who watched the world final when I boxed Marlena Sparza everyone will say well no, Lisa, you should have got that decision. It went down to a split draw or whatever, and then they had to select. I don't know. It was like the old scoring back then. Um, so I just lost out on being a world champion by, you know, so such a so close margin. So it wasn't like I was just, you know, Average. not proving myself. Yeah. yeah so I, I find that quite strange, Lisa, that, like you said, not having a chance, like, let's say, in a year or a year and a half, let me have a chance to try and have a box off. Because otherwise, it's kind of like, what's the point of you guys being there? Yeah, sometimes you felt like you was probably, you know, you'd, you were there just in case. You was, you was the spare part, you know, if anything happened or any injuries mm. and, and so on and so forth. But it was one of those times where I just had to bide my time knowing that she would she would leave after uh, Rio Olympics because um, I knew I would never get that opportunity to try and uh, qualify for them. I was never given that opportunity. As soon as she leave, left the squad, then I was the number one spot. And obviously, you know, I, I think I had a shoulder operation and then five weeks later I was back sparring and went to Europeans, got a bronze medal after having a massive shoulder operation. And then straight, and then after that was the Commonwealth. So, you know, I would, I would always medal for GB. I think if you look how many medals I've had over the years for, for Great Britain at major tournaments, I'll probably up there with, with most of, well, I'll probably beat most of them, to be fair. And this is the the incredible thing about what you're saying is for someone to have that ability and the thing is it's it's happening a lot in the pro scene as well so someone to have that ability and not be given the chance to shine having that grit and determination i admire it yeah there's a, don't get me wrong there were times where you know i would think what am i doing this for and like you say you all that sacrifices and everything and then not give being given the fair chance at times but don't get me wrong, it was an awesome setup, and the coaches were absolutely phenomenal up there. You know, I made friends for life up there as well. Um, I'll never ever regret being on GB, and the memories I've got and that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. You fractured your school, didn't you, five years ago? Um, tell me about that story, because I don't know if that was within boxing or was it, I don't know, oh, no, domestic. No. Well, That's even worse. It was so straight after, literally, the, the same. When I should have boxed Nicola at the ABAs, it was that day I boxed and beat, I think it was Kim Shannon. Um, I think it was Kim, so Nicola had pulled out. So I won the national title again. I think I've won it about seven or eight times now, I can't remember. So we're like, people ask me, and I, like, yeah, people ask me and I don't, I don't, I can't remember. Um, so funny. we went for a, a lovely family meal to celebrate and literally as we was leaving my husband decided he needed to go to the bathroom so i sat on the outside little wall waiting for him and well from this is what i've been told because i'll never ever remember it the top of the wall broke off on my hand and i fell backwards um but it was a five foot drop onto the public pavement backwards because i was sat where the steps are you know to go to then walk home and um yeah I, Eight hours later, I woke up in hospital. I believe, from what like people have told me and my family have told me, is that obviously I was out completely cold. Um, my poor husband, you know, went through that absolute mill of panic. Um, I, I believe they were asking me what year it was. I said it was 1953. They asked me my date of birth. Didn't know my date of birth. And then the funniest bit was my sister told me, because obviously my sister, when my husband rang her, she rushed to the hospital and she was supposedly sat next to me in the hospital. I must have been coming in out of consciousness or coming to. And the doctor said, and who's this? And I turned to my sister and said, I don't have a clue who she is. So they obviously panicked. But then supposedly I started laughing and saying, no, it's my sister. <laughs> so I was still having a crack and a joke, <laughs> having had this head injury. But yeah, I, um, I fractured my skull tore my ear canal so my balance well i'm pretty deaf now in my left ear and i've had issues with my balance for quite a long time um and then memory struggle with my memory quite a bit now um so yeah it was pretty horrific to have 
had like a you know 140 advice and then have a freak accident we, i should have been going to spain the week later at a tournament and i should have been going to the european games and obviously i missed out on and that was like a multi-sport event so i'd never done a multi-sport event by then and i'd qualified to go to them and um, so i had to pull out of all that and yeah spend a few days in hospital um come home and straight away i was like right get my bike get my bike out john he's like what and i went well i've got to get get my keep my weight down and i've got to get back keep my fitness up and he's like what are you talking about so thinking about what i actually went through um it was pretty horrific to say the least i used to get up in the morning and not know how i would feel and then i'd get up and like walking down the stairs it'd be like i'd be walking down millions of stairs um, like I'd had 10 pints of beer, you know, my balance was, the balance was the biggest issue for me. Um, it was quite scary to say the least. So I saw specialists and um, they didn't know if I'd ever box again, to be fair. And obviously me being me, well, that's not going to happen, is it? So I um, carried on training, got myself fit, saw some other specialists feel like save like your balance with your crystals if they're dislodged so i have this epley maneuver um done it, it takes minutes and i was like no way is that going to fix me i remember one day i was i was laying in bed with my husband and we're just chilling which is very unusual for me and all i can explain is is that someone had pulled the bed from underneath me and i was just falling and then next minute my eyes would just shake constantly and the only way I'd be able to stop it is turning to my right side away from the side that it got fractured which would then stop the shaking of the eyes stop the dizziness and they say it's just because of the crystals and like I say pretty deaf in my left ear now which is always a good sign because good good a good not a good sign a good <laughs> thing to have because my husband can snore at night time so <laughs> so, so, <laughs> I was going to say, it's probably when he's talking, I just put that yeah, ear yeah. in front of him. Yeah, it's when he's snoring in bed, I just turn on to my good ear and leave my bad ear up and I can't hear anything. It, it works really well. Benefits. Yeah. To be fair, eventually I got through the balance side of things and it's like I, I get hit, but I get up again. No, I think that's probably I the mean, best thing to say. Uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, people can say that they've got that fight in, in them, but you really have got... I mean, it's a ridiculous how well you can bounce back from situations like that. But there must have been a, a, a feeling at some point, Lisa, that, oh, I don't know if I'm going to box again. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I also, you know, it's a big topic at the moment, not at the moment, but it's more of a topic that people are quite happy to talk about and not feel judged on, is in the mental health. And yeah, of course I struggled. I struggled, and I think, because they say with head injuries, you know, it is a big sign. You know, I've, I've been taught with a police officer, if you go to a car accident, someone's had a head injury, they can wake up, can be quite aggressive, they can be d disorientated, and then obviously you've got the, the mental, the mental health side of things, and... I've got to say, I have struggled since having had that head injury. From then onwards, I have had my battles and I have had my really, really tough times. And I'll quite happily speak about that because I think you need to. And, you know, yeah, I do look like I just crack on and fight. But then behind closed doors, I have my tough days. Do you feel like sometimes you have to, I'm not saying put on a front, but you are a go-getter, Lisa. And, and sometimes when, when you have a personality like that, you, you don't give yourself a break. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that is it. And you just, you just, you, you kind of in the p position where you just have to crack on. And it's like, you've just got to because, you know, you, you've you got to do it because people are seeing you as that inspiration. But yeah, it can be very, very tough at times and I never really give myself a break. Um, but, you know, it, it did catch up in, catch up on me in the end and it did have detrimental eff effects. Um, like me and my husband, we went through a time where we, we separated for a few months and I hate, I hate to talk about it, but yeah, it happened and boxing had a part of it my mental health had a part of it and you know relationship issues as everyone health everyone has and it was just coming to terms with that you know things can't always be perfect at times and sometimes you just have to sit back and just think sometimes you're gonna have tough times aren't you yeah absolutely and i think um females try to juggle everything and be great at everything 
and you know almost be a superwoman and it's just not possible all the time not all the time <laughs> <laughs> people don't see that in the sport of boxing it is a tough tough sport physically and mentally such highs but then there's such lows um, and I think if you spoke to most boxers professionally amateur uh, it, you know they'll 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 say the same so you can see that can't you with like some of the pros that have you know they've got world titles and then they tell the story afterwards and what they've been through and the biggest thing is the is the mental strain isn't it i always say lisa that it's important i think for people to speak out um i find it courageous because this is such a, a like you say a brutal sport but people sometimes don't feel like they can speak about it and i think by somebody like yourself going listen i've had good days but there are days where i found it tough um i commend you for that and i, I know that that will help people as well you finally make that decision to take a break from the sport uh, get pregnant fantastic um but talk to me about you know the process because it wasn't that easy was it no um basically um because of making the weight of 51 kilograms which isn't a natural weight you know i made it and i i made it comfortably because i was very very strict um but it was testing on my body when i turned over i turned over pro and stayed at 51 kilograms to fly weight because there was the adams fight there and that's what everybody wanted so i stuck to it and i stayed at that weight um to then hopefully get that you know uh, that fight but unfortunately she retired me and my husband we've been together 16 years and we've always wanted a family and i've never ever said I w we've never delayed it i've always said to my husband whenever you are family boxing stops and he's an absolute well he's just a gem and he looks after me and he's always been dead honest and he's like no i'm happy i'm happy where we're at and um and then eventually it was like i feel like it's time that you know so Boxing wasn't the biggest of priorities. However, then what, what then it came to realise was I came off the contraceptive pill and things like that, thinking, you know, we're going to look to try and just see if it happens. And my monthly cycles didn't occur. So I had to wait a good six months and then go to the doctors. And eventually it came out that my monthly cycles weren't occurring because of the weight making. So it was stopping the reproductive side of things for me. And that's that's a, a natural thing in terms of it's not a natural thing, but it happens, doesn't it, for female athletes? Yeah, I think it's quite a common thing for elite athletes, and the specialist um, obviously recommended me hormone medication, but then just said it is down to my weight making. So I should have boxed at the back end of 2019, and it was going to be for like a WBC international belt, and I straight away pulled out of it. And I rang Sam and Adam up, who are my managers, and I said, this is what I've just found out. I'm so sorry, but priorities have changed. And you know what? They were unbelievable. They were like, no, Lisa, we completely understand. I said, so I'm stepping. And at that point, I was stepping fully away. I didn't even think about a return. Started on the medication. Um, felt. Um, I think it was the second time through the, 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 the course of it, fell pregnant, but unfortunately we lost and had a miscarriage at six weeks, which I think is quite common because of the uh, medication that you're on. It's one of the side effects, which is a bit strange, isn't it? But yeah. for um, And then the second time through was not with no hormone medication, natural. It was in lockdown and... Little man's here now, so lockdown alert. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how it occurred. <laughs> oh, just, just, I guess what happened is just you were chilled, yeah. no stress on the body, yeah, and, and you know it did its job. And then Lisa Whiteside decides, <laughs> listen, I can't just have a straight forward birth. <laughs> I mean, you had a difficult time, didn't you, uh, with the birth? Yeah, do you know what the pregnancy? I had the best pregnancy anyone could wish for. I didn't have morning sickness. Oh, did you not? I didn't really have cravings. Probably just craved eating. I can't say that I'm, I'm going to... I can't even give it as an excuse. I just ate. So, you know I mean, I'm just ridiculous. It's just... I think it's just an excuse when they say cravings. Um, I trained all the way through. Had absolutely no issues. 
Uh, I think the only thing my ab split, which they said because of been being so tight, they would do and it would occur. Um, but I, I pretty much I jogged and ran and did everything up until a couple of weeks before. Um, people would be giggling at me in the gym because they'd obviously I'd be on the runner and then I'd turn around and they'd just see this big belly and they'd be like she's pregnant she's on the runner um, you know I'd ask Mick my coach Mick pad me will you and he would do he was absolutely brilliant uh, absolutely loved the pregnancy and you know I was I couldn't wait for the, to be fair I couldn't wait to experience the labour side of things um, you know me and my husband and my plan was you know, obviously, a natural labour, try and not go for pain relief if I didn't have to, but, you know, open, open-minded because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and, yeah, started early hours in the morning, Christmas Eve, um, that I woke up in bed and I was like, oh, something doesn't feel a bit right. My husband just carried on snoring and the midwife came and I got examined and things like that, but I wasn't really, nothing was really moving and so on and so forth. The actual late, like from start to finish, it was 65 hours. So, um, wow. Yeah, it was mad. So then we went from going to be induced and by the time I got there, um, my I dilated enough where I didn't need to be induced so I got to go to the birthing center which I wanted which he had the birthing pools and relaxation and things like that so it was like happy days um but this was on this was Christmas day now and I'm like I can't believe he's going to be a Christmas baby anyway we carried on I chilled out in the birthing pool went through all the pain of going through obviously contractions and things like that um but there was something just didn't feel right and it was the pain I had in my back was immense but I didn't know if that was right or wrong because I've never had beside a baby before and then eventually it came to light that baby was back to back and his positioning that's why I was in like excruciating pain things weren't progressing and when they were monitoring him there were just a few concerns so they gave me the option about four hours prior and they said he's you know he's showing signs we think we might have to go for a c-section i was like do whatever obviously i want my baby to be safe i'm not bothered and then eventually emergency c-section came into into play um again i was quite calm about it strange sensation having obviously an epidural and and that sensation but when they went to come and get him out he was then stuck so um baby's head was stuck in my pelvis uh, and he wasn't for coming out so as you can imagine there's me and my husband in this operation theater with his screen and all we heard was a specialist shout get james get james whoever james was i'm guessing he was the consultant or what and then um, next minute i had about six people bouncing on me i could feel that you could feel the sensation but obviously no pain um but it was horrific it was terrifying um, me and my husband are there, lay there. Obviously, all this movement's happening. I'm asking what's going on. I'm shouting, what's happening, what's happening? And they obviously, their priority, and they were an amazing, amazing, oh, unbelievable what they did. They're not there to tell us what's happening because obviously they can't give you false promises and things like that either, can they? Um, but it took a long, long time. Eventually, they got baby out, but we didn't hear him, so that was the fear of that and then it was right straight on to me and then we heard baby cry so i was like but in my head i was like there's something up with him what's just happened um to be fair when we heard nothing of it i thought he i thought he died i didn't even think he was going to be here so um they started saying about me and what they needed to do to me and um that i'd ha that they needed cameras and stents and blood and i'm thinking what's going on here so eventually the midwife brought baby over and put him on my chest but this is whilst they're still working on me and um, and i think they worked on me for an hour and a half but basically because they had to pull him up with his feet out my belly and they had forceps they had people pushing him out other people and and um, that i then um was caused internal damage um, to the, like the wall of my womb and loss of blood and but it got to the point where it was a bit like what's happening here am I actually going to be okay so I don't know if it was just sensible mode kicked in or I don't know why but I turned to my husband and I said I love you 
I love Jensen, look after him, tell my mum I love her, and passed on messages for my family as well. And he's going, don't say that, don't say that. And I was so calm and collected, but I suppose I just had to think, I don't know if I'm going to be here or not. And they, and they had baby on my hair, but because they were, I said, oh, take baby away. So they, I, mean, I had a picture of me, John and baby, and then the midwife held baby well. They um, obviously worked on me. John was absolutely phenomenal. He stayed so calm. All he was bothered about was my heart rate. Because I kept saying, go and check on baby, go and check on baby. And he's like, no, no, no. I just, I want to, and he was more, cons obviously he wanted to be with baby, but then he was thinking, what's happening with with me so what was lovely was the midwife she said i'll hold baby with you so john stayed with me and then obviously baby with a midwife so an hour and a half later i think it was about roughly that time um they gave us a thumbs up and said everything was okay and then i turned to my husband and he just bawled his eyes out crying absolutely broke down he did and obviously i shed tears but he was just heartbroken he really was i think it was just the relief and even like the anaesthetist she was just like your husband's been amazing because kept me so calm so so calm so yeah we then had this little miracle baby so i believe well the the actually they offered us counseling the debrief does three times and if you went on to the, where we were at the maternity everybody knew about my labor because it was obviously so traumatic and the main thing was he you know that the scariest thing for me was all i cared about was jensen and what was happening with him where john was like worried about both of us but it, it it's just one of those things isn't it he didn't even look like the same baby the day after because he was he was black and blue he was bruised he was swollen because obviously he was stuck and then the trauma of them obviously getting him out of out, out of me the, the, the one compliment they did say was that it was tough they had to my c-section cut is double the size because they struggled to get through my muscle <laughs> so i was like yes <laughs> shows i still got good abs <laughs> which is always important yeah so but yeah eventually we got put into like the recovery room and there was me john and baby and yeah it was just it was a surreal but amazing feeling and i suppose it was tough because people like oh that feeling when you first get given your baby when you've given birth and i never got that but just for what we went through, I think it's made us even closer and even stronger of, as, a, as a family. Firstly, uh, John is amazing. Yeah, um, is. <laughs> the unit that you guys have is just, it's, it's really beautiful. And like you just said, I can imagine that it's brought you closer together. Having now met Jensen, you wouldn't have thought that that little <laughs> cutie pie would have caused <laughs> much trouble. I know, I know. He looks all sweet and innocent, doesn't he? <laughs> Most beautiful child. He really is. And I mean, I guess uh, that that's the saving grace that he's so cool, calm, just chill, didn't he, really? Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong, I was so scared. After he was born, he was born with a big hematoma on his head, so obviously because of the swelling and the pressure. So then that was my worry, is, has there been any damage, has there been anything, you know? And because of the trauma of what happened, obviously I was in hospital for a couple of days, but when I came home, well, babe, baby got weighed for the first time and his weight dropped massively. So we was back. We had to go back into hospital, purely because of the trauma of what he'd been through. He was just exhausted, sleeping. I probably wasn't producing milk like I should do because of what I'd been through. So, yeah, scary times. And but God, now you think, even like little things. I'm like, why is he not smiling yet? Is it because of what he's been through? Has he had any trauma to you know? And you're constantly worrying. Yeah. Um, but now he smiles. He's dead alert, and he's. Obviously, the lump on his head went down beautifully. When I got him checked up at eight weeks, the doctor was like, "He's it, the shape of his head's just beautiful." I was like, "I know." He's got a little tiny. Head. <laughs> yeah, a little pea head. <laughs> that's like that's what my husband says. I've got a little pea head, so he obviously takes after me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he is a uh, what an absolute gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous child. Really, really is. You've spoken in the past, obviously, about losing your love for boxing. How soon after giving birth were you like, no, nah, I'm going back and I'm doing this for Jensen? It was before giving birth. It was after 
I was twen after 20 weeks pregnant and I knew he was okay and I knew he was on his way, I already had that desire to box again. I'd already spoke to Mick, my coach, about it and I've said, Mick, I, I said, obviously I know it might be different when he gets here. I might think, no, no, I, I don't want to do boxing anymore. I said, but at the moment, I've got that desire that I want, I want to get in that ring again. I feel like I've got unfinished business, you know. I did the amateurs and I finished on a high. I've done the pros. I've only had three pro fights and I know I can. And I, and I know I'm good, go, I know I will do, is that get a world title. That want and the desire that hadn't been there was back there and bubbling. I just concentrated on the fact that I'd had an emergency C-section backtracked me a little because obviously the recovery of that but I think because I kept myself fit prior to it my recovery was really good and really speedy. They advise after six weeks after having a c-section to get back training so five weeks out that week I tipped out some pads and did a bit of tech work. We actually started from scratch which was awesome and so just going over things and bringing new things into play as well so and then just built it up nicely i'm loving it absolutely loving it the word inspiration gets bandied about a lot but your story really is inspirational and i'm guessing that this is just almost the beginning of the story do you know what i mean um i have no doubt that you'll get a world title oh, thank you very much i have absolutely no doubt just gotta stay ready and be prepared to, to jump on it when I can. Uh, just hope I'm given that opportunity. You know, I, I do feel like I have got that pedigree. I have proven myself as a boxer. Um, yeah, I had three pro fights and then I've come out of it and going back. But I just hope I've got that belief and that backing behind me and I can then show the world what I'm all about because my style's perfect for the pro game. So, you know, I'm not a runner. I want to scrap and I want to, and, and I know I can hit hard. I used to drop people at 57 kilos and stop people as an amateur at 57. At 51, it's difficult, isn't it? But I still took my strength down there. However, to be coming back bantam, super bantam, it's just going to be, uh, I, I know I'm going to be so, well, I know now, you ask Mick now and he's like, Lisa, you, you punch the strongest you've ever punched. It's like, I've got that mum, what do you say? I've got that mum strength now. Mum strength? <laughs> not not man strength, no, mum. Mum, Because I'm a mum now, I've got mum strength. And I tell you what, it, it's true, because I'll do anything for my boy, so I am getting him a world title, so nothing's going to stop me. I don't doubt it. I'm just happy, Lisa, that it's not me on the receiving end. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for, you know, just sharing. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me into your home. Oh, you're very welcome. And this is my first podcast, and I'm really glad that um, I was be able to share the experience with you. There are no fights coming up this week um, with any of the major promoters. Uh, I think uh, there was one that was cancelled. I think there was a Queensby show that was cancelled. And so uh, I think the first fights now are the first and second week of June. Um, so, yeah, I guess people are going to have to tune into those small hall fights. Um, Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, drop a comment, like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know when we drop new content.